I'm Ken Weinstein, Japan Chair here at Hudson Institute. I'd like to welcome our in-person audience here in Washington, D.C., as well as our online audience around the world to today's discussion, the evolving relationship Europe and the Indo-Pacific. I'm absolutely delighted, I'm honored to welcome Eva Maydell, member of the European Parliament from Bulgaria to Hudson Institute for the first time for today's event. Now in her second term as a member of the European Parliament, uh, MEP Maydell was first elected in 2014 as the youngest ever member of the uh, European People's Party, the Christian Democrat coalition uh, ever elected to the European Parliament. She is widely recognized in Brussels, including by Forbes list of 30 under 30 leaders in Europe, as well as by Politico and their 28 top leaders in Europe, shaping Europe as well as here in uh, Washington and in the Indo-Pacific as a leader on technology and trade issues. She serves on important committees in the European Parliament uh, on economics, industry, research, and energy. And she is the uh, EPP speaker for the Special Committee on Artificial Intelligence. We're delighted that she's taking time from her very busy schedule here in Washington. She is here in Washington in her role as a member of the delegation for relations with the United States of the European Parliament. But for our purposes, she plays that role and she is also vice chair of the delegation for relations with Japan. So welcome to this uh, Japan chair event. We're delighted to hear from uh, MEP Eva Maydell. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Ken, for offering so kindly to host this discussion here at the Hudson Institute, uh, a place that I refer to as the beacon of leadership, uh, critical analysis, but also remarkable analysis and trustworthiness um, in DC. Um, so thank you for this uh, kind invite. Um, Everyone I meet asks me, what have you been up to? Did you just arrive? Are you leaving? Um, so let me tell you, I've spent the past week um, in New York City, um, and um, I arrived yesterday uh, here in DC, uh, where together with some of you, uh, we crossed paths to the Special Competitiveness Studies Project Summit. Um, and in New York, I... Uh, um, attended meetings in, in, on, on related to UNGA, but also clean tech um, and tech. But it's particularly important for me to meet this group today because um, I um, consider it to be a thoughtful uh, exchange. Uh, because with some of you, I have worked strategically at the topic of hand today, which is the future relationship between Europe and the Indo-Pacific. Um, as Ken mentioned, um, I'm probably uh, mostly well-versed when it comes to topic related to tech and competitiveness. Um, but nowadays, uh, those are not some sort of isolated topic or geeky topics themselves. Uh, they are more and more intertwined uh, with geopolitics, which is one area where I struggle to often uh, explain uh, with some of my colleagues in Brussels. You might be surprised at that, but we can talk more about it in, 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 in the discussion uh, part. Um, I'm also one of the main negotiators of the European Artificial Intelligence uh, Act, and I also was one of the drafts people of the CHIPS Act, as well as other several as well as several other digital laws uh, that you might have heard from uh, coming from uh, Brussels over the past um, a couple of years. Uh, most of the work that I do uh, with the Japanese uh, has been centered around my work on artificial intelligence, clean tech, but most importantly our shared drive for innovation in our economies. Um, and I say this um, and give you a little bit of an overview um, of what I do because I know I'm in a panel and in a room and in a discussion of uh, experts on Japan and Indo-Pacific. Uh, and I must say I'm very, very curious to learn today um, from you. Um, 
Before I address the topic briefly, let me just give you a little bit of a, a broader view of where we Europeans uh, find ourselves and where I believe we need to channel our energy when it comes to the Indo-Pacific region. Um, in many ways, Europe seen uh, from inside um, seems to be doing quite well. What I mean is that um, we are maintaining a relatively good socio-economic uh, European uh, way of life. We have uh, shown uh, a strong unity when it comes to our support uh, for Ukraine. Uh, it would have been better if it was faster, if it was even more ambitious. But we have heard so many voices always when a crisis is approaching, that Europe's not going to stick together. And yet again, Europe has shown resolve and that we and our ability uh, to stick together and uh, to deliver uh, um, on the expectations. We are also in the same time uh, working on an ambitious climate agenda. Um, and uh, we are front runners, definitely, uh, when it comes to regulation, but I would like to think about it on, uh, in a way on value-based tech agenda. I can go on on the achievements part, um, but on the other hand, uh, what worries me and why I would like and appreciate an honest exchange is that Europe is lagging behind in the area of innovation and in the area of economic growth. Um, in a way, we have some of the best researchers uh, in the world. We do have talent, even though it's ever more difficult to attract uh, talent, as you all know, no matter where you are in the world. We tend to think of ourselves as creative, but when the moment comes to bring the product or the innovation from the lab to the market, this is where things don't go that uh, right often. This is why I feel in a way, and it might sound a little bit provocative, but for us to have an open discussion, I think we are a little bit sleepwalking into another crisis. That's not going to come tomorrow or in a month, not even until the end of the year, but we're going to feel the effects of this low growth um, and a very um, a society that's unfortunately not prepared enough for future sh shocks in the next uh, years uh, to come. And this is why I believe the biggest issue for us to address in order to be able to be better prepared, to be able to respond to future shocks, is to address the problem of lacking competitiveness. For the purposes of today's discussion, I think the best way to address that um, is, um, you know, not uh, by closing ourselves, by closing our doors and aiming for some sort of a, a extreme version of strategic autonomy. Um, I disagree uh, with uh, some colleagues of mine that think we need to establish ourselves as some sort of a regulatory fortress. I think it is more important than ever that we strike uh, alliances build bridges with our international partners. Um, we are in a global competition in a way between democracies and autocracies. So I think that whoever wins um, that race, particularly in the tech front, will be setting the rules for the years to come. Uh, and this is why I think it will be important to lead uh, as Europeans, uh, but we cannot just expect others to somehow follow. We have to uh, be going down this path hand in hand with our international democratic partners and allies such as the US and Japan. Um, when it comes to EU-Japan relationship, I think for uh, everyone in this room uh, is no secret that the golden era of those relationship was during the Juncker Commission. Um, he and Abe had a very strong uh, relationship. They signed an economic partnership. They reached a data flow uh, agreement. But of course, uh, COVID um, and the changes in uh, both uh, governments in Europe in general and, and Japan, uh, I, what I worry a little bit is uh, putting those relationships in inertia. We have a little bit of uh, that uh, risk, uh, even though uh, if I 
reflect just what happened two days ago when I was at the Atlantic Council Gala in New York, uh, where one of the awardees of their yearly awards um, was um, uh, Prime Minister Kishida, um, and the award was presented by Ursula von der Leyen. The way she presented uh, that award and the warm words she expressed of the leadership of the Prime Minister gives me a lot of optimism um, that perhaps if there was a bit of inertia um, in our relationship, uh, we are looking uh, towards it in a, in, a, in a renewed way. And this is why I think it is now the time for uh, um, you know, revitalizing this political push um, forward on the EU-Indo-Pacific uh, relationship. Just very briefly, and I'll end there, I think um, I would like to outline three ways uh, where we can cooperate and um, um, refresh this political push. And I'm sure many of you have a other suggestions, which I'll be happy uh, to hear. So I would first start with the area that I know um, best, and that's the artificial intelligence and uh, emerging technologies. Uh, to say uh, Japan is a natural ally to the EU in this field would be, in a way, an understatement. Um, we are both a beacon of democracy that also puts innovation at the heart of uh, our work, and I think there's a, a, a whole lot to learn from uh, one another. So I think it's up to us uh, Europeans, uh, but also to the US and to Japan, uh, to bring uh, together also other democratic allies to set the rules um, of uh, this technological development in a democratic uh, manner. Uh, because I'm afraid if we don't, uh, either others would never be willing and interested to put some guardrails, uh, but they would definitely um, uh, be advancing ahead of us, uh, such as uh, China. So in this sense, uh, I don't think the cooperation is something that we should be wanting to do and that will be nice to have. It's an absolute must to have. Um, and this is why, it, again, it gives me a lot of optimism, um, the way um, the G7 has played out, particularly the Hiroshima process on generative AI. There are a lot of promises. Um, I um, um, haven't met yet that many people that believe the process has sped up necessary, but I think by the end of the year, uh, we should be uh, hearing more, and hopefully there will be com concrete uh, deliverables. Um, I think it's important that this process fits well within the European AI Act process, uh, the White House voluntary commitments, um, and the list goes on. Uh, but also, uh, in this respect, uh, what could be very valuable to do is to think of forming a TTC with Pacific partners. Um, but one that is uh, full of meaning and sense. Uh, so if we compare the TTC uh, between the EU and the US that we currently have, it has quite many working groups. It was set up at different times. So perhaps it's time to prioritize it. It could be one or two topics, one or two projects, but just to uh, make sure that it's focused and that it delivers. So the one with the Pacific partners could have a similar dimension. Second point is if I zoom out a bit, um, I think it's important to look at technology and infrastructure more broadly. I've long believed that the right kind of regulation can propel forward um, innovation, and Japan is an example of putting innovation at the heart of uh, the way it sees technology. Um, um, Prime Minister Abe had lots of good ideas about the data flows with trust proposal for global uh, data flows, but also on a free and open uh, Indo-Pacific. And I think these are all ideas that has to be brought again uh, on the table. And um, also, I think um, Japan and the EU are working together on joint global infrastructure and connectivity initiatives under Europe's global gateway uh, agenda. Uh, but that agenda still needs to be unpacked, and so it needs a real momentum and, and financing, um, I, I believe. Um, my last point um, is uh, looking at Europe. Uh, I have long called for Europe to have a renewed China policy. What I would like to see, though, is also a renewed Indo-Pacific uh, strategy, and one that is not uh, just uh, based on triangulation uh, with uh, China. I think this strategy 
uh, cannot ignore uh, Taiwan, uh, where a stronger cooperation is definitely needed. And I believe uh, we can still have that. Um, and, and it's possible while still respecting the one China policy. Um, I think we can improve and deepen collaboration through chips diplomacy, for example, uh, or through a bilateral investment uh, agreement. Um, I think any Indo-Pacific strategy must take as a, a point of departure a viewpoint that what happens in the Taiwan Strait is completely Europe's business. And I say this uh, despite President Macron's comment um, at the start of the summer. I think it's Europe's interest to maintain a democratic dominance in the Indo-Pacific, which also means that the USA should be keeping its naval dominance and democracies such as the pa Japan, uh, South Korea and Australia uh, should be strengthened, should be supported and should be uh, given preferential treatment. Um, so to sum it up, uh, I think the EU, the US and Japan, we share the same belief when it comes to life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, so that's how our foundations of democracy uh, rests. And I think deepening our cooperation and relationship is there uh, for common sense. And it is an absolute uh, necessity. And I believe here in this room, there is a number of allies that would like uh, to see that uh, happen. Thank you very much. Okay. I want to thank uh, MEP Madel for the, those characteristically thoughtful, multifaceted, and frank comments, and uh, something we're not always used to from uh, <laughs> policy officials either in the United States, uh, Europe, or Japan. Uh, so, no, it's really appreciated. And uh, um, and your comments were so rich, there's so much to draw off of. Uh, you know, one of the things that strikes me, you talked about uh, Prime Minister Abe and Juncker at sort of the high point of uh, Europe-Japan uh, uh, relations. Yesterday, Shinzo Abe would have been 69 years old, and I was uh, thinking about that <laughs> yesterday, I was thinking about it this morning, and uh, obviously the loss is still uh, yeah. a painful one yeah. for all who uh, knew him and all who admired him. Yeah. But we, we, you know, that being said, there is there has been a it's been a really dramatic year of leadership under Prime Minister Kashida in the G7, and and uh, you know, one of the things that uh, um, Prime Minister Kashida very early on said about uh, uh, Ukraine was what happened in Europe could happen here in the Indo-Pacific, and there there is a sense, uh, you know, that. Uh, uh, and particularly under Prime Minister Kashida's leadership, but also uh, with credit to, uh, to Commission President uh, von der Leyen as well for uh, in a number of areas uh, in the last few years uh, taking a far more nuanced position on China uh, than earlier would have been done. She think, you know, we, we, we've, we have seen a real shift from sort of the high point of the, the EU-China relationship or the high point of the European-China relationship, which I think probably was at Davos in 2017, where President Trump did not show up, Xi Jinping showed up, pretended to offer some kind of a defense of the so-called rules-based order. Uh, it was sort of at the high moment of the 17 plus one uh, ties between China and, and European nations, lots of talk of investment, mutual projects of cooperation and the like. And, you know, through COVID, through Hong Kong, through uh, uh, treatment of the Uyghurs in Xinjiang, through awareness of what Huawei was about, you know, sort of the wheels kind of came off the bus on the, the China-European uh, relationship. And uh, we instead, you know, saw this, the critical leadership of Japan in the G7 and on the issue of Ukraine, where the United States view Japan as bolstering uh, our leadership in Ukraine. And, and, and I'm just, I'm wondering, uh, you know, as, 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 you, as you, you, you look at these developments, as, as you uh, see this movement, it was, and I, I hate to cite her, Liz Truss, but she is the one who used the term the Euro-Indo-Pacific, talking about the joining of the, the two theaters in a way. And, and there are obviously a lot of people here in Washington who are skeptical who think that if we're going to face off 
uh, someday or prevent a face-off against China in the Taiwan Straits, that we need to move our focus from Ukraine to China immediately. And I just want to get your sense on that as a softball question before we go into some others uh, here. Um, <laughs> well, um, I, I think we need to, first of all, understand that the way Europe sees geopolitics is very different um, than the way the US approaches this topics. So we can never see eye to eye on those topics, but what would be very helpful is if we exchange more between each other of how you view that part of the world and how we view it. And maybe sometimes Europe needs a little bit of a push mm -hmm. to come up with its renewed strategy mm -hmm. on the Indo-Pacific. Um, my worry is that we look too often into ourselves mm -hmm. and we do not prepare for a possible scenario of escalation. Sure. We also don't have a defense Europe, a defense union in Europe. Um, most, you saw how slowly we acted. Um, we, there was resolve, there was unity, but we were not as swift as we would have, some of us would have liked mm. to see when it comes to Ukraine. Um, so if, if, if we want to strengthen Euro-Indo-Pacific relationship and our view and our strategy, mm -hmm. we need to definitely uh, you know, uh, make sure that this is somewhere in our key priorities. Mm -hmm. um, currently, we have one main goal and priority, and it's the right one, to make sure that we support Ukraine as long as it takes, but that Ukraine wins the war. I personally cannot that it wins the war as soon as possible. But you could see that the sentiment that that might happen as soon as possible is not there yet. So until the war is not won, I think we have difficulties of properly investing time and energy into looking beyond Europe's borders too much. Mm -hmm. well, that, that makes sense. But, but simultaneously, as you know from your remarks on the technology challenge, that even if you don't want to look beyond your borders, your borders are being affected by what China is doing. And th there's been this real shift, the famous words in the, the, in the European Indo-Pacific strategy and that the European leaders use to talk about Europe as a partner, competitor, and rival, mm -hmm. and much greater emphasis now on the rival side of the, that uh, triptych rather than, or that uh, trinity, if you want to call it that, than uh, on the partner side these days. And, what, 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 and, and, and part of it goes, and one of the areas of, you know, we obviously saw the focus on Huawei, the focus on uh, telecommunication systems, which was a big focus for the Trump administration and, and a big focus in Europe. And the, the, I think we, we made major progress in that domain. But as we look at the Europe, the, as we look to the electrical vehicle domain, uh, mm -hmm. which is an area which because of the, uh, the decarbonization priorities of the European Union, it, it, we're increasingly hearing from uh, particularly the German automakers, uh, even uh, uh, Oliver Tipsa, the chairman and CEO of BMW, talked about the, the China challenge in this area. And it is a challenge that goes to electric vehicle technology. It is a challenge that goes to uh, the rare earths needed to make the batteries. It is a challenge that goes uh, to uh, supply chain dependence. Uh, is your say, it, one of the interesting things when you talk to automakers in Japan, they are saying you need a multifaceted approach when it comes to next generation vehicles, that we ought to keep a focus on hybrid, but that hydrogen should be a much greater uh, component of the future automobile market, in part because hydrogen is an area where Japan can play a critical role, the United States can play a critical role, Saudi Arabia wants to play a critical role. It, it doesn't necessarily have to lead to the kind of dependence on China that electric vehicles do. What's your sense of where European regulations are with regard to electric vehicles from China, the challenge that that poses? Hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. So it's a great question and a topic that it's now very much on the table with uh, Europe, and that's why I think you're posing that question, yeah. because uh, President von der Leyen announced uh, just 10 days ago that we're going to start an investigation uh, into um, electric vehicles coming from China. I don't know what's the time frame, and of course we don't know what exactly it will conclude, but the truth of the matter is that of course 
uh, we are facing um, a, a flooding of the market, if I may use sure. that word, of, of um, e-vehicles coming from China. Um, I think there's a number of things we need to be concerned and worried. Let me zoom out for a second. Sure. I think we should have been thinking about that not today, a long time ago, because sure. this was something that was coming. And this is not about our, it's not only about our car manufacturers uh, having that big competition. It's a, a bunch of other things. Sure. Um, and it has to be seen more comprehensively, because now we are focusing on that investigation. And we, what do we think that's going to fix all our dependency, that's going to fix, a, you know, that's not sure. going to happen. It, let's see what it will conclude. But this is just a tiny bit of what we should be thinking and what we should uh, you know, be considering and strategizing. That's my worry. The plan and strategy have been delayed. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they have been delayed because of European companies, yeah. because of some European member states, and because we crafted so difficult that strategy years ago sure. of how we see the Indo-Pacific, of how we see China, that no one really wants to spend the time uh, and the effort into renewing that. But it is absolutely crucial and necessary. I think I've mentioned we are sleepwalking into another yes. crisis. Didn't we learn the dependencies from Russia that we had? And we thought that as long as we cooperate and we buy their gas, what happened was not going to happen. Um, we cannot have that men mentality anymore. We cannot be, you could call it naivety. Others call it differently. We unfortunately cannot allow ourselves to have that. So this is why this question on e-vehicles is a tiny part of the puzzle. And I would like us when we are in Brussels, and the reason why I'm critical, I'm a passionate European, by the way, and I'm very positive on Europe overall. But I think in forums such as this one, we have to have an honest and frank discussion because I believe together with the US, we can craft those strategies better. They can make more sense and they can benefit Europe. They will probably benefit the US, but it's about the, the most democratic allies coming together. Um, and so um, when it comes to the, the whole supply chain of, of how do you make an electric vehicle, I mean, Europe has had some good regulation in that uh, uh, area and that domain. That's also, I like to think of it, not just carving and ordering the market, but being more, making us more prepared, like the CHIPS Act or the Critical Rose Materials Act. We had regulation around batteries. Um, so these are all good steps. Uh, but uh, we are also not taking the steps that are, uh, how do we secure some of our industries today? Um, I don't know. There's, there's, we are being, as I said, a bit distracted with the current crisis. What we need to make sure is that we are able to prepare and plan and strategize while constantly being in a crisis. Because we have experienced one crisis after the other. So I don't see a time when we would have the luxury of uh, you know, um, thinking about resilience. We need to be thinking about resilience um, today while we are in a crisis. Yeah, no, it, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating to see because I think in part, I'll, I'll, I think I could probably be a little more frank than you were, but, you, you, but you've, been, you've been incredibly frank. And part, part of the challenge has been the Germans to begin with. Uh, on Nord Stream, they were the challenge. Uh, period and on the auto industry because so much of their auto industry has been dependent on China for so long and they saw it as the future market they have been uh, less than willing to sort of make the necessary adaptations but although now they are they are they're late to the game again and they are they're pushing for it significantly and so we could see some significant adaptation but the, the issue that you bring up though touches on a, a broader theme that's been very sensitive in uh, EU, Europe, uh, U.S. relations, which is the the question of trade, resiliency, and friendshoring, which is, you know, how do you balance our technology, trade, supply chains while not hurting our friends and allies? Uh, and and it's it's you know we've seen it uh, uh, here with uh, obviously the major clashes over um, 
uh, invest, you know, the various investment in the United States programs and the Biden administration's efforts, particularly to, to uh, promote manufacturing in the U.S. We've seen massive uh, tensions, I call them, between the U.S. and the EU. Do you see ways that we can, we can overcome these tensions? Particularly, you sit on the TTC, the Trade Technology Council, are, and the discussions, I'm sure, have been quite, uh, quite frank, quite vivid. Yeah, so my proposal would be that, so traditionally, Europe is strong in its, first of all, traditional industries, but most importantly, as I alluded earlier, we're seen as a regulatory uh, place, okay? One law after the other. What we do basically is set standards, goals, and aims. Let's take the Green Deal, for example, yeah. which I think uh, one could regard as to it as a, one of Europe's bigger goals. The Green Deal was proposed pre-COVID and pre the war in Ukraine. Um, it was proposed to where we want to get when do we want to get yeah. the way the u.s does it is well let's see how much investment and how much budget we can put into making sure we get there this is where we can learn we are good at putting the standards the regulation but we are not so good when it comes to capital to investment to innovation to entrepreneurial spirit and it would be good to use the ttc not to think, because very often, I, I mean, I'm one of the rapporteurs on the chip side. Very often, my, my colleagues are like, we need to write this in this way so we are better than the US. And I'm like, the real issue is not the US when it comes to the That's chip true. side. Neither when it comes to clean tech. Mm -hmm. We are competing with something that's much bigger and transparent. We don't exactly know what's going on. So we need to cooperate together to make sure we are strong enough and again, I say it's not just between the EU and the US. Japan, other democratic nations, Canada, UK, they have to be all brought on board. Um, but there's a mentality that has to change. Mm -hmm. And this, what my real point, and I try to mention, and I hope it resonates, is that the, you know, US, our US partners cannot just say, well, this is our position on China. Basically, you have to have the same position. Ours will be a bit different, sure. but bring us closer to your position, and we'll bring you closer to some of our goals and views when it comes to climate. And you know, we can we can work out in ways where, but the mentality has to change. I think on both sides of the Atlantic, right. uh, there is cooperation, of course. We're the closest allies, but it has to go deeper. No, I I, I couldn't agree more. I think we have uh, long in the United States had this uh, sort of Cold War mentality that we could sort of tell our allies what they need to do, and you, you, we could do that in 1948. We could do that in 19 in the 1950s. Uh, we can't do that today. We see uh, countries have different strategic uh, visions, different strategic uh, climates. Uh, that you know that doesn't mean you know. And I think through frank conversations and through sharing our strategic perspective, that is absolutely necessary. And it's. And I'm, I'm, and I think it's look. It's been, let's take the example of Japan, the free and open Indo-Pacific, which you mentioned. That was a Japanese strategic vision that we adopted in the United States. We adapted it too, but there is definite room uh, for us to uh, learn from each other as allies. And I think it's, uh, I think it's critical also that uh, the EU and Japan take actions sometimes that are independent of the United States, and that. Uh, you have credibility in areas we don't. The mm -hmm. Japanese have unique credibility in Southeast Asia, where we have not really been present since the end of the Vietnam War. We're trying to change mm -hmm. things. And uh, the EU obviously uh, has broader credibility, not, with, not only within its borders, but uh, in, in the area beyond. And so it, it, it's critical as well. Let me open it up. We have a really distinguished audience here. Let me open it up for uh, questions from uh, the audience. Please identify yourself. Try to keep your comments as, as brief as possible um, and direct them, obviously, to MEP Medell. Uh, great. Uh, wait, please wait for the microphone. Thank you very much. Jesse Friedlander from DeVoe Partners. Um, I'm interested to hear your views on the, um, the potential vo policy volatility, uh, European Union uh, in terms of the climate, the Green Deal, as you mentioned, going forward, because if we look, we've seen 
the European change policy dramatically in recent years. We saw with when President Trump was telling Europe, you know, you should, we're against Nord Stream 2, you should boost your military. The European policy was the opposite, and it's changed. And then we saw, say, in Germany, the, the dramatic closure of the nuclear facilities after Fukushima, and then burning coal. We saw it on immigration. So I think we're seeing a lot of policy volatility. So I'm just wondering, to what extent can we um, have confidence, or the Europeans have confidence, in this new energy climate policy, which is incredibly ambitious and will be very complicated, and new events are going to arise that might challenge the efficiency or effectiveness of those policies. Thank you. Do you want yeah. me to okay. yeah, respond directly? Um, so thank you, Jesse. Um, it's a great question. Um, it's something that um, I do think quite a bit on. Why? Uh, as I mentioned, the climate policy came out four years ago. Today, if you talk to the largest European businesses, um, they're unsure where they can meet the targets, um, not because they might not be ambitious enough, but because the prices of energy over the past couple of months, two years almost, the inflation has hit them so hard. And some countries were able to support their industries, others less so. So um, currently, I don't see the appetite and the hunger from European societies themselves to reach those goals. Having said that, that doesn't mean we are not continuing to pursue those goals. But we need to make sure that, apart from the goals, we give the investment part. And we are currently working on that. We should conclude those negotiations by the end of this parliamentary term, so next year at some point, probably, or a bit earlier. Um, but we've missed the last few years to support enough with targeted investment uh, industries. If you look into um, where Europe's strengths were, we used to uh, be really good in manufacturing uh, solar panels. Now, the ones we use uh, are 92% coming from China. Uh, wind turbines, we used to have the 15 companies that produced wind turbines. We lost most of them. Now they're between four or five, and uh, they're struggling. <laughs> they're having big difficulties. Um, I'm saying all this because four years ago, when you set your climate agenda, you need to take these things into consideration. You need to make sure that a third piece of the green transition is permitting to put those facilities in place. In some countries and some regions, it takes you maybe two years to get a permit to build a solar park. Um, so how can we reach those goals in that manner? Uh, we are saying you're not going to be able to buy and use diesel car from 2035. Uh, I believe, don't quote me on that number, it needs to be checked. Um, but we are not saying how is this going to happen. Um, so on the innovation part, we also need to do a lot. Um, so I don't think we are necessarily going to change that particular policy, but it's going to be very difficult if we do not change um, the incentives of how to get there on other topics. Um, we often get our um, acts together after something has passed. So the uh, banking and economic crisis uh, that had happened uh, made the world wake up uh, to the situation and made us have very stringent laws. So recently, in Europe, we haven't had um, you know, an issue with a bank or in overall our systems are quite robust. But it took us time to go through a crisis and then come up with a proposal. Now, many in Europe are calling for the way we take decisions to be changed. Not with anonymity, but maybe with majority, simple majority, or depends on the topic. That would mean we need to change the way European treaties are and the way we have set up the European Union. But many think we won't be able to respond to um, geopolitical challenges, defense challenges, if we do not change that. Um, but this would change the essence of the EU. Um, so that's a whole different discussion. 
but many would like to see a defense union, an idea that has been there for a long time. Some countries are supportive and others are not. We have seen that we are able to um, change our energy dependence um, on a very high price, but it was the right thing to do, absolutely. So we need to think about different ways of cooperating. We need to think, how are we going to invest in LNG terminals, for example, um, and infrastructure projects? Um, it's, 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 it's very, very complex. And you have 27 member states that need to agree and stand behind those, uh, those goals, those aims, those budgets that need to be uh, allocated. Um, so I think you can see um, some legislation coming from past events. What I want to see is legislation that's preparing our economies for some of those uh, future problematic events, if I can call them this way, maybe not to happen. But that's usually not a very uh, you know, appealing thing for politicians to do, for media neither. You're being asked, but why are you doing? The threat is not there yet. It's difficult to justify. Sure. Let me turn it to Tom Dusterberg, a senior fellow here at Hudson Institute. And Thanks, Ken, and thanks for your uh, 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 very enlightening remarks to both of you. Um, uh, apparently today, uh, the U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai is giving a speech uh, recommitting the United States, apparently, to uh, WTO reform. Now, in, in the light of what China has been doing the last uh, 30 years and in light perhaps of uh, the United States attitude towards the WTO and uh, things like the uh, CHIPS Act and other inward looking investment vehicles. Do you have any confidence that we can achieve uh, decent reform at the World Trade Organization or should we be looking to some sorts of parallel uh, bilateral, multilateral, plurilateral uh, uh, arrangements to bypass the WTO? Um, thank you for that question. So I'm not very well first on the WTO, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a broader comment, which I think would still address your question in, in a way. Um, I do have a lot of respect for organizations like the WTO. However, I do think that the way we have to take decisions, particularly in tech, for example, because that's an area that I know best in a way, um, has to go beyond the normal framework, the normal institutional framework that we know today. Because we need to be faster, we need to be responsive, we're dealing with issues that we don't understand that well. Uh, and we're dealing ever so more with issues that have a profound change, make a profound change in our society much faster than, than before. Um, so when it comes to tech, for example, I would definitely want us to sit around a table all together at the same table and talk with democratic nations with representatives of civil society, academia, engineers, uh, companies themselves, the private sector, uh, but bring us all together, not book 20 tables uh, for two people uh, each. Uh, but the way those big institutions work, um, it's a very comfortable way of working. Um, they gather different views, but sometimes the results um, you know, are, are not very satisfactory. So perhaps finding ways of how to reform, again, I speak in general terms, um, could make a lot of uh, sense. I was for the first time in the UN in, in March this year. Uh, it's not something I think that parliamentarians do on a regular basis from, from the EU. I talked on topics related to tech and women, and it's a wonderful place to meet people and exchange views to understand how different your views are, also to understand how Europe is seen from the outside, which we should more often think about. But when it comes to results, I'm afraid they lack teeth, uh, they lack concreteness, uh, and they lack ambition. Another place that uh, we're seeing greater convergence between the EU, the US, and Japan. Let me yes. turn to uh, Christian uh, Forstner, the Hans Eidel Stiftung. Okay. No, thank you. Um, 
Thanks, uh, Ken and uh, Eva, for this uh, powerful statement. Yeah, I couldn't agree more on, on this commitment yeah, to either to, uh, well, both to a more united and powerful Europe yeah, and to a stronger transatlantic relationship, yeah, also with regards to uh, the Indo-Pacific. I have two questions there, Ken, and if you allow, uh, I uh, address one to you. Uh, also, Good. yeah. What are, Finally, uh, what, <laughs> are the, uh, here. <laughs> what are the? What are the? If you summarize, yeah. What are the benefits of the uh, U.S.-Japan uh, free trade agreement, yeah? And uh, what might be well um, a template, yeah, for the European Union, yeah, also to go this way. So, what are real, What has changed positively uh, so much? And Eva, uh, also, yeah, because you mentioned yeah this uh, change of mindset, yeah, so we have to be more respectful yeah, to each other, yeah, but still have a strong relationship and partnership. The CHIPS Act yeah, on both in the US and Europe. Yeah. How do you reconcile these mm -hmm. two competing mm -hmm. concepts of uh, strength, strengthening our resiliency, yeah, but not going against each other? Yeah, sure, why don't I go first that you've been doing all the talking, which is natural as uh, the member of the European Parliament. Look, I, I, first on the, the EU and Japan have a trade agreement. They have a in ETA, and uh, it was something Shinzo Abe sought after it was clear the United States was not going to uh, remain in uh, TTP and that the United States was not going to uh, seek a free trade agreement. Uh, last week here at Hudson Institute, we had the honor of uh, having Vice President Pence uh, outline his foreign policy vision for his presidential campaign. He stated openly something I think a lot of us in the U.S.-Japan field knew, which was that uh, there was a time early in the Trump administration when uh, uh, the vice president and then Deputy Prime Minister Taro Aso, Minister of Finance of Japan, were working on a free trade agreement uh, between Japan and the United States. Uh, in the end, uh, the president didn't want to go that direction. Uh, uh, United States Trade Representative uh, Bob Lighthizer didn't want to go in that direction, and instead we had uh, kind of an interim agreement that was more of an executive agreement between Japan and the United States that uh, came to the fore, I would guess, in uh, September of 2019 that put in place high standard, uh, high digital standards for a trade agreement uh, that borrowed from the framework around the U.S. Uh, Mexico-Canada agreement, uh, and, but that left room for a potential trade agreement between the two countries moving forward. I think as you look at uh, the rising recognition of the strategic challenge China plays and of the greater need for the United States to be present in the Indo-Pacific, a number of us here in Washington, uh, including my colleague and mentor Tom Dusterberg, who just spoke, have been trying to think through ways that the United States could eventually, over time, re-enter the TTP, which would be critical to give us an economic uh, presence, a much deeper economic presence uh, in the Indo-Pacific. But like the Europeans, we face now a new challenge, which is that we have seen Chinese as companies have sought to build out their China plus one strategies uh, and move manufacturing away from China. We've seen Chinese companies doing the same and moving heavily into Vietnam, into Thailand, Cambodia, and Malaysia. So uh, we need to be careful that uh, when we are negotiating this trade agreement that we're not essentially opening the back door to China again through uh, manufacturing facilities that are, in a sense, Chinese-controlled. Um, and so it's, it's a similar issue to the challenge we face on the automobile manufacturing issue, which is an issue we face in the United States with both uh, Tesla and uh, heavily reliant on China and now Ford uh, using C ATL uh, battery, building new battery plants in conjunction with uh, CATL of China. Um, uh, with federal subsidies, and so it's 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 a challenge that we face together. So, but I think if we, depending on who the Republican nominee is, if it, if it is someone from the more internationalist camp, uh, I think we could see a free trade agreement and reentry to TPP would be on the agenda. Uh, and depending on who it is, it it might not be on the agenda. But I think there there is need to also rethink about TPP as well, which could be a high standard trade agreement between uh, uh, the US and, and Europe, uh, that uh, economies, high wage economies with skilled workers, it's not the kind of trade agreement you have where you, you kind of sign something and then it's, you open it up and it's a can of worms and you've lost jobs here and there. So it's something I think we need to work on and uh, certainly the Japanese have been at the forefront uh, of 
doing these kinds of trade agreements now that they have stood up independently from the United States in this domain? Um, if I may, concretely on the CHIPS Act. Um, so, uh, I overall think that we did not look at both CHIPS Act as a clash, even though I gave earlier an example as what some of my colleagues would say, which is still true. Uh, but very often, if I'll give an interview, you know, um, journalists will be very positive. Look. Europe and the US have woken up to the challenge. That's great. It's, it's very good that, uh, that you are uh, planning to do these investments to secure the supply chains. Um, and I think that um, if we look um, where Europe is now on its uh, chips and manufacturing, we have between 9 and 10 percent we produce in Europe, uh, between 9 and 10 percent of the chips we use. So we would like to double that, maybe get to 20, 21 percent, which does not make us not dependent. It just makes us less dependent. So where I see a room for collaboration is, first of all, um, enhanced role of uh, research and design of chips uh, and where those communities can cooperate more, particularly when it comes to more advanced chips. Second of all, most importantly, on the monitoring of supply chains and the way uh, we exchange information and just the collaboration with the international community. The way initially the European CHIPS Act was designed was designed as a crisis tool. Crisis happened, we need to be able to order to the chip manufacturers in Europe what to do and how to do it which if anyone understands the complex system, that's almost impossible to do in a short time frame. And then you actually understand how the whole system works and you understand, well, it's so complicated that, you know, so we in the parliament revamped the way the CHIPS Act was, was made in order for it not to just uh, try to intervene in a crisis, but to prevent from a crisis. And this is where the EU and the US have a very instrumental role to play of how we make sure we prevent a crisis from happening. Um, so these are the two areas where we can uh, work more that are on top of my, uh, my head. But I'm sure we could think of, of other ways. I mean, after all, some of the most important investments coming to Europe are coming from US companies. So um, I think this is also another way of us cooperating, of course. Thanks. <clears throat> I'm Bob Hershey, I'm a consultant. Uh, to what extent could you use more of the internet and what you're doing to get more transparency and get things quicker? Maybe we take one more. Yeah, one, one after this is the last one. We'll speak one, one after him. One more. Okay. Uh, uh, Why don't we take this okay. one? We'll uh, thank you, thank you, uh, thank you for your speech. My my name is Ken Abe uh, from Marbury Corporation, a Japanese private company. So uh, as a, a corporation, I always wondering so what is the meaning of the economic national security? So in the recently, I uh, found. I'm so sorry, can uh, you repeat that? What's the mix? Economic, economic, uh, economic national security. Yeah, economic okay. security. So, and uh, I recently uh, found that meaning might be the national security is prior to uh, economic or business. So, but so today I heard your speech, and uh, I just wondering. So, how about uh, if you compare the uh, climate change and national security, which one is your priority? It's actually a great question since I think it's, it's something that hits at uh, what's been a big debate in the United States, particularly on the electric vehicle front uh, with regard to dependence on China. So it's a great yeah. question to wrap up with both our well, I will respond yeah. to both, but very briefly on that. I mean, um, when we speak about e-vehicles, in the US, the first thing uh, that you think is about the e-vehicles coming from China is about what about the data that they're collecting? <laughs> In Europe, that's not even part of the discussion. So you could see the different way of approaching this topic. And um, this is exactly where we need to bring our thoughts on it and your thoughts on it together and discuss it. Uh, because for me, it's a problem that we don't think about it from a security perspective, not even, well, maybe someone does, but we don't do anything about it, right? 
So um, that's an issue. Um, you you said something about climate change um, and national security and what's the. Um, I mean, again, I think my answer just demonstrated it. Uh, basically, uh, we. Uh, we have to, we don't have the luxury anymore not to think geopolitics when we talk chips, when we talk AI, when we talk e-vehicles. Um, and I'll give you an example. When the chip stack was initially presented close to two years ago, I remember I was at the Munich Security Conference and a very thoughtful roundtable was put uh, together with all those important actors from the chips ecosystem. Back then, this was prior to the war. Back then, we were focused and, and towards the end of the big lockdowns of, of COVID. Back then, with that ecosystem, we particularly and only discussed the CHIPS Act. How much we'll go for research? How is the state aid going to work? A year later, we had the same gathering. No one wanted to talk about the CHIPS Act anymore. It was all about how politicians need to understand the way business thinks and operates and how the business all of a sudden needs to understand geopolitics and how the politicians that talk about geopolitics, they need to be talking about economic security as well. Um, I don't know how much of that is yet understood. Now is, we're like eight months after that meeting. Uh, but I am working hard. I know a few others are working hard. I can see there is a lot of critical uh, mindset here in this room as well. But we need a little bit of push to see that in, in that perspective. Because I think in the long run will be necessary. Um, it, 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 we, we cannot support our societies the way we are and our way of life. Um, should we not um, have the growth we first need to focus on making sure that Europe grows, our economies grows, while keeping an eye on the geopolitical challenges out there. Having the strategies, having the plans, is absolutely necessary. And only then, hopefully, we can avoid some major crisis happening or be better prepared. Well, I want to thank uh, MEP Medel for uh, waking us up out of our sleepwalking, <laughs> and as she does uh, in Brussels and, and elsewhere around the world, and also for coming to this, this critical set of issues with a, with a clear strategic vision and also a message that others need to focus on this strategic vision, that it can't just be tactics, it can't just be responding to crisis, but you have to step back and, and view things in a strategic perspective, which is why you've become such an influential voice in Brussels and elsewhere. Thank you so much Thank for making so the much. time to be here. Thank you.